everybody and welcome once again to the first step. My name is Gary Labe. Uh, this channel is dedicated to bringing you tutorials on concept art and illustration for the entertainment industry. And I hope you find something useful here. If you do, please hit the subscribe button and stay tuned for a lot more exciting things to come. Uh, today, we are going to be chit-chatting about some card art. Now, this colorful character is for a card game called Goblinade. Uh, from the wonderful people over at Paper Night Games. So let's jump right in. So to start off, I want to I want to talk a little bit about um, some of the things you need to consider when designing for a card game. Uh, the first thing you want to figure out is what are your constraints. Uh, mm, Pretty much every card game is going to have a frame around it, and so the illustration that you design is going to have to keep that in mind. You don't want to design somebody that has a lot of nimbly, bimbly arms and legs uh, that shoot way outside the, the dimensions that your, uh, your card frame is going to be, because then people aren't going to see your work. Fortunately for uh, this particular illustration, I'd actually helped design and uh, worked on the original game. So I'm familiar with the constraints and I'm able to just kind of uh, spitball a design. Uh, it sort of opens it up. But for any other company, whether you're designing for uh, Wizards of the Coast um, or anybody else, uh, you want to consider what, their, what the aspect ratio is for your, um, for your project. Uh, another thing that you want to keep in mind is um, the silhouette of your character. How is this character going to read from afar? All of these illustrations get shrunk down to fit within the constraints of the frame, um, and you want to be able to ensure that whoever is holding onto that card has an easy read of what that character is or who that character is. So um, make sure that you're using uh, clear shapes, and uh, I would recommend. Uh, while you're working to to shrink the canvas down and then zoom back in see how it reads from afar and if it's kind of muddy a little bit blurry uh, you know try to rework some of those areas a bit so in just a moment we're going to be slowing down the video to um, explain how we use the warp tool which you can find in your transform menu uh, all you need to do is hit control or command T depending on your operating system uh, and you, a bounding box will appear around whatever layer you're working on. If you pause the video here, you'll see all the different options available. Uh, we've selected the warp tool, which brings up this grid around the illustration. And it's, it, it allows me to manipulate uh, my drawing so that I can, I don't know, make it feel a little bit more fluid and make the pose a little bit more interesting because I was feeling that the, the pose itself was very static. Now you can actually manipulate your, um, your image in one of two ways, either by uh, pulling up on the bars like you can see me doing uh, here in this example, or you can actually click and drag within each of those squares uh, to push and pull the image around until you're satisfied. Alright, so as we uh, dip into the refine sketch i just wanted to let the video play and just chit chat a little bit uh, about artists and personal projects uh, i can't tell you how important i feel it is for every artist to have uh, an, uh, a personal project to work on um, i've worked in a lot of studios over the years and it's been fantastic but um the one thing that i've noticed is that after a while of working in the studio and working on the project i'll get a little burnt out creatively and so that's when a personal project comes into play, whether you uh, redesign 80s uh, cartoon characters or you do a webcomic, wh whatever it is. Um, artists, I feel, need that creative outlet. And what it helps to do is maintain your creative energy. Um, I know a lot of artists who've gotten a little burned out, a little fried, a little jaded over the years. Uh, and what they've what they've needed to do or what they've done is they've, they've started a personal project and and many of them have taken those projects so far that they've been able to to leave the studios they've been at or, or stop freelancing and just focus all of their attention on those projects so whatever it is you want to do uh, creatively I recommend you do it 
spend the time to, you know, yeah, you spend the time to flesh out your portfolio, but, but, but do it in a way where you can work on a personal project at the same time. So I highly recommend it. If you have any questions on, on, on starting a project or the projects I'm working on, go ahead and send me a message or, or leave a comment below. Um, and I'd be happy to uh, talk with anybody about that. So uh, we're about to get into um, the underpainting, which is uh, basically where you paint beneath your line art to establish your light sources, uh, uh, color palette, and all that stuff. Uh, I start by uh, blobbing in a whole bunch of the gray um, just to give myself a solid base to work with um, beneath my line art. Uh, and then just like with my previous tutorials, I will um, create a multiply layer and just start filling in really heavily where I want the shadows to fall and then reduce the opacity on that layer once I'm satisfied. Um, I'm gonna have two light sources in this one. Uh, one will be coming from the, uh, and, well, from the upper left and one will be sort of a backlight. Um, and so I'll be able to create some cool glow with those ribbons. Um, what I'm doing right here is um, creating an, an overall tonal wash where it's lighter at the top and darker at the bottom. And that uh, helps me to um, figure out where I want to put the most detail. Uh, I know that the face, the hand, um, the shoulder, chest area, that's gonna have the most detail because that's gonna be what's focused on for the card. And then a little bit lower, it'll still have some detail, but not much. So once all the light sources and tones are in place, I start to, um, throw down some color. I like to use the greens and browns and, and, and I want to make the, the mummy look old, but I still want it to be colorful. So I create another overlay layer and fill that with a purple, a nice rich purple, and then um, a little bit more blue at the back. Uh, I erased out a little bit of the purple in order to create um, sort of a tone that goes over the whole piece where it's lighter at the top, top and darker at the bottom, but it still has color so um, it still feels more vibrant. As you can probably tell, I'm working on very minimal, a minimal amount of layers. Um, my process generally is to paint on as few layers as possible. So if I start a new layer, I paint something down on top of it, I will then flatten it with the layer below um, just to help myself um, focus on actually painting and not trying to figure out which which layer I'm on. Um, I do save layers that uh, at certain stages. So if I'm working in grayscale, um, I'll save all the layers that I painted to create the tone and the light. I'll make a duplicate, a duplicate. I'll make a duplicate of all of them, and um, and then save them in a file. You can see there's a file beneath my base layer there, my background layer. Um, uh, but then I'll flatten all those images, I'll flatten all the duplicate layers together, and then paint on top of those. And for me, that just helps me to, to, keep, um, to keep my mind focused on painting and less about layer management. Now, you can do it however you want. You can have a million layers. I know incredible artists who, who work on a lot of different layers, but um, for me, I like to keep it as, as simple as possible. My organization skills are not top-notch. So in order uh, to start painting above the lines uh, or start the final render, uh, I'm color picking directly from the colors that are available in the character already. There's only a few times like with the teeth where I introduce a new color, but for the most part um, I'm using the purples, the blues, the greens, yellows, uh, browns, and um, uh, save for doing like the, the um, subsurface scattering, uh, I pretty much stick with just those colors in order to render out the forms and, and add the little details. Um, so yeah, color picking from the already existing palette.
at this point I'm pretty happy with the progress so far. Uh, so I've compressed, or I've compressed, I've flattened all the layers um, to one layer, and now I need to strengthen the pose or strengthen the silhouette of the character. So I'm using the liquify tool. And how I did that was I go into filter, and then there's a, uh, one of the options says liquify. And it brings up this screen where you can uh, manipulate the, the piece a little bit more fluidly. It sort of makes it like water. Um, and you can push and pull and stretch and, and, and warp and everything you do on this screen will affect your drawing um, once you're done. Um, I used to not use this tool, I used to just want to paint it out, um, but I really found that uh, using the liquify tool puts in uh, another level of energy that sometimes is difficult to get uh, in the initial pose or in the initial painting. So, liquify tool, highly recommended. Now right here, I was feeling that the eyes weren't doing exactly what I wanted them to do. So while I have, um, while I have the image, uh, which you'll see in a moment, I flatten it down to one layer, uh, I'm able to use my, uh, my lasso tool and select just the area around the eye and make a duplicate layer of that using Control or Command J. And then on that layer, um, with this, that's just the eyes, I just go in and use the warp tool like we did before and it's able, it allows me to put the eyes more in, in the place that I need them to be. The one thing I will say about working on one layer is that it allows me the freedom to, to carve out parts of the silhouette that I really need um, to be there. Uh, I don't have to worry about erasing on one layer, then going to another layer and erasing that, uh, and so on and so forth. I'm able to just get it all done in one fell swoop. Um, it makes it a lot more easy. Uh, you, can, uh, you can see here that I'm starting to put in all the little details, I'm starting to erase out uh, where the the fabric is, is hanging free. I, you can see I'm putting in all the holes uh, and tears and then painting those in on the figure as well. Um, and it's, it, this is, the, um, this is the, the detail stage of the process.
So right here we're coming up to the end of the painting um, and I want to add um, a bit of texture to uh, over the whole image. So I select the image and um, create an overlay layer and then I choose a very spattery brush to kind of create this um, dappled effect over the entire image. Um, and it helps to create sort of a unified texture uh, and, and, and kind of makes it feel a little bit more interesting. We're coming up to a point right now that I sort of glazed over in my first tutorial uh, where I use the noise filter um, on a separate layer. And I wanted to explain that a little bit further. So I, I've duplicated the entire silhouette of my character and um, went up to filter, uh, filled it with a gray, like a medium gray, uh, went up to filter and um, chose uh, noise and then uh, add noise. And uh, the noise is set to uh, Gaussian monochromatic. And um, what that does is just kind of fills the whole gray with, with static, it looks like static. Uh, I reduce the opacity on that once I'm satisfied with how much static you see and uh, change the layer to overlay. And um, what that does is sort it sort of unifies all the colors, it sort of pulls the piece together, it kind of gives it a, a finished look. I don't always use this. Sometimes I sometimes I, I find that I don't need it, but uh, at times like this I really kind of like to use it as it feels like it ties in the piece a little bit more. And there you have it. This is the final image of the mummy for Goblinade by Paper Night Games. Uh, I want to give a big shout out to my friends over there at Paper Night Games. Uh, if interested in tabletop games, please follow them uh, on the link provided here. Um, thank you for watching this video. I hope you've learned something. I hope you had a good time. If you have, uh, please subscribe. Uh, share the video with your friends and family and anybody else who's interested in art and the entertainment industry. My name is Gary Labe. You've been watching The First Step, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.